that, that resources more than anything else place upon Asia, aren't you forgetting the, the resilience of, for example, Chinese uh, technologists. I mean, they have invested massive amounts in renewable energy. They are building, I believe, right now more than 100 new nuclear power plants. So when you say there are these clear, obvious resource constraints on China, maybe you're underestimating the Chinese. No, I'm not underestimating anyone. I think technology has, uh, has a role to play, and I suppose the the, the areas where I disagree with Dr. Rajan is firstly, I don't think the American political system uh, will adjust in the time frames that are, that are needed to, to deal with the issues, and climate change is just one of those issues on a global level. The second point is I don't think techn technology is the panacea for the issues we're talking about here. And that again is part of the, the, the rhetoric that has dominated the space. So instead of talking about the need for us to live within constraints. And I think it's very important that those of us who talk about constraints and, re and restraining are not seen as people who don't understand the world. I want to put it out there that we understand it's those who have continued to pursue this argument that there are no limits and technological fixes, free markets and finance will solve the problems are the ones who need to be challenged. Because if yeah, you look at it, many technologies have actually aided and abated the stripping of natural resources beyond anyone's imaginations and creating very unequitable uh, situations. But I'll tell you uh, what strikes me. The thing that you may not understand, ironically, is the Asian psyche. You're an Asian, you're born in Malaysia of Indian parentage, but it seems to me you underestimate the, the question of of, of justice that is felt by Asians here. Think of the Copenhagen Climate Summit. Yes. Many Chinese delegates and others said, how dare the West tell us that we have to sign sure. on to mandatory sure. caps on our emissions sure. when the historical emissions of the West are the fundamental problem at issue here and it is they who have to act, not us. This is a justice issue and you haven't mentioned and justice And we need to move all. well beyond that. We need to move well beyond the blame game. We are where do we are most in Asians history. are ready to do that? Are most Asians ready to uh, say, okay, I, I accept that I can't have a motor car. I can't have that big I don't think a car ownership is a human right. And, and the point we're talking here about is where's the political leadership and what does the world look like? I mean, just to take cars for example. If car ownership levels in Asia uh, start to match what is it is in the OECD levels, OECD levels, we will have by 2050 something like 3 billion uh, passenger cars in the world, of but which Carlos, 2 billion... Carlos Ghosn, the, the, the boss yes, of yes. Renault Nissan, says that that is precisely why he's confident about and his what business would you plan. Well, well, what would he you expect him to, to say? Of course, you can't ask Pizza Hut to sell less pizzas. So Carlos Ghosn wants to sell more cars. The reality is, most of our city is already dumps because of too many cars. We cannot, and, and all the fuel and energy needed to drive those cars is just simply not possible. What we have instead is the rhetoric of green cars and all, this is pure fiction. This will not happen. Take Germany. But, but let, let, let's this go cannot back. happen. Uh, let's bring Mr. Rajan in. Sure.